Okay. Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my podcast. And today we have a very special episode, and we have Ray Hecht here. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. Um, so can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself right now? Because a lot of us don't necessarily know a lot about each other. And since you're like all the way across the other side of the world, probably people don't know too much about you. Okay, well, thanks for having me and letting me introduce myself. So I guess I'm a bit more of a distant relative. Um, so uh, how can I put it? Basically, your grandfather, Zadie, was kind of like my surrogate grandfather. But uh, I'm kind of like related through um, his first wife, Jean, his, uh, her sister, uh, his first wife, Gloria, sorry. His sister was Jean, who is, whose son was my dad, Rick. And so the Hecht family were Rick and, and my mom. And so when I was a little kid, we would like come to your grandpa's house and Nana and Zadie and like have Thanksgiving there and Passover dinners there and stuff like that. So when I was a little kid, I lived in Indianapolis for a while. Um, and, um, and my life story is a long story, so. <laughs> I actually, do you have your book, right? Yeah, oh, I'm so, so honored. <laughs> Let's just say that I sat down and read this entire thing yesterday. Oh. It was so good. Um, it was so good. I hope that was a good summary <laughs> of, of it all. It was really good. I was super interested in like just the funny like little tidbits that you put in there were really interesting. And I like your artistry. Like I could not, I'm not good at drawing. So I'm very impressed with like anybody that can draw. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> um, so let's talk about your childhood. So where were you born? Where did you grow up? How was your upbringing? Was it a happy home? Well, uh, where to start? So my dad is from Chicago, the same as some of your family. And um, he moved to Israel like when he was in his 20s in the 1970s or something. And so I was born in Israel. He met my mom there who was from the Ukraine and the Soviet Union. And me and my sister Alana were born in Hadera, Israel, or part of Haifa, Israel. And then after we were born before i can remember we moved to america so i don't speak the language and i don't have any memory of, of being there when i was a child and initially yeah we all lived in indianapolis and at that time i was closer to my cousins and i would see like susie and all them and danny and your dad and, and everybody uh, Mark and David, and uh, yeah, when when I was a kid in Indianapolis, um, I guess my my parents like would fight a lot, and and then they like eventually got divorced when I was twelve or so, and it's, it's I don't know, it's a somewhat like normal American story these days. <laughs> it's not the most traumatizing, um, but I don't know. I was like maybe a nerdy kid. In some ways, maybe like uh, not the most sociable, but I watched lots of cartoons. I don't know. At a certain point, I got very into comic books, and that like became my main thing. Uh, which again is thanks to your dad, Mark. And yeah, when I was uh, a teenager, I, w I went to live with my dad and. Cincinnati and Cincinnati kind of became my adopted hometown so I lived there probably the longest and yeah I, don't know, I went to high school there I went to the first few years of college there uh, where, where, which time period to focus on <laughs> you direct um, me so actually let's talk about your like high school middle school experience so you didn't really do well in school to your opinion in like the book that you wrote what was your relationship with school yeah, I, I don't know. I love to learn, but I'm just not very academic naturally. I don't know. My sister, Alana, was always much better at getting good grades. I got good grades when I was a younger kid in elementary school, but then I kind of slacked by middle school and high school. And I don't know, I kind of barely passed 
maybe I hung out with the wrong crowd. <laughs> I don't know. But eventually, I, I suppose I got it together. And yeah, um, I think that for me, just the whole sitting down for eight hours in school just w was harder for me than it was for other people. And what can I say? I don't know. Do, does it suit you? Do you like high school? <laughs> yeah, I, I really like high school. But I'm. it's nice because um, I don't necessarily know what school you went to or it was like Prince something. Yeah, like it was like Princeton High School. It was a big school. There were like 2,000 students. Yeah, a lot my of things to my do. I just didn't take advantage. Yeah, my school is about 300 of us. Um, and so like we're a pretty Nick like tight close community um and like it's much easier for like me to get like one-on-one -on -one help from like a teacher and so i guess that at a bigger school that's much more difficult um yeah yeah I mean, lost in the in the shuffle i will say i liked college a lot more like college is just so much more freeing you can you can choose any class you want you can stop if you really want to you can i don't know you're you're not like super penalized for being late and you have to be in a certain place at a certain time you know that you can make your own schedule i don't know it suited me a lot more anyway um so did you actually get kicked out of high school is that what happened yeah that's a little bit of an embarrassing story but i got kind of expelled in my senior year and i i don't know I, a lot of my friends were at that particular time like went to vocational school and didn't take take high school seriously at all or, or later they got like a ged test um but what happened to me is uh it was after the columbine high school school shooting which is kind of a dark time it was the first time in america that really became i don't know a national tragedy for everybody to to, to be scared of and I, if I can remember correctly, because it's a bit of a blur, I just made jokes and was trying to be like a bad alternative kid or something. Probably a, a very bad idea, but I don't know. I, I kind of got kicked out. Maybe it was something like a temporary suspension, but I didn't want to go back. In your book, um, it's but just, yeah. You can go ahead. You oh, no, no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, there were some rumors in the school that like there was going to be a shooting, and I would just like v be very sarcastically joke about it, and they and they did not appreciate that those kind of jokes. <laughs> um, but what happened is my dad, very much to his credit, in retrospect, he he pushed me to go to an alternative education center just to get the high school diploma, and so I spent the last half year or so finishing high school that way, and I'm very glad I did. <laughs> you know stay in school school, school kids uh. um so you talked about your sister and her being kind of like not the more like academically driven were you ever jealous of her uh yeah i was super jealous <laughs> i think um she it was weird um i even wasted a, a few like gap years after high school and then by the time i started going to college she also went to college even though she was younger than me and um yeah i don't know she she did the you know the proper dormitory experience she went to california later and i became like roommates with her because i wanted to move to california and yeah she did well and she got to travel to japan with her high school japanese class and i was kind of jealous of that but i mean i i, sh I could have if i really applied myself as well but it is what it is you know <laughs> She um, has a family life now. It's a different path than me. But, but yeah, I was, uh, you could say I was jealous. <laughs> um, so let's go back to your parents' divorce for a second. So how did you feel about them getting divorced and specifically your mom getting remarried? Um, well, initially when they got divorced, like I remember it being a relief because I don't like how they used to fight. And... I don't know, they used to fight speaking Hebrew, and I think that's one of the reasons I ended up being kind of bad at language, because to me it was like a language of people yelling at each other a lot of the time. And they just weren't suited for each other, and 
I know, it's just a relief. In the movies, whenever kids get divorced, the parents always give the speech about how it's not your fault and we love you. And the kid's are like, oh, is it my fault? Please get back together. And I don't remember feeling that way. I was just like, I don't know, I guess to a degree with all the moving, I was just going with the flow. Maybe I didn't have close friends or attachments because we did move a lot already when I was a kid. Um, that was probably be the biggest challenge though, is just moving to a new place and having to resettle. But honestly, I thought it was kind of a relief. It wasn't, it was kind of better than when they were married, unfortunately. And yeah, so later she got remarried and it wasn't like her husband was my, was my stepdad. It was any kind of a surrogate father figure to me. He was just this guy that it was more like a guy she was dating or something but i guess they lived together and uh, my sister jasmine was later born as well from from that side um but it was it was kind of nice when i was kind of a rebellious teenager around 16 or so that I, there would be this other place i could go stay at on the weekends if i wanted to and in her house, there was no discipline. I could just do what I want. And you know, my dad would tell me what to do and there might be arguing, but and at my mom's house would be the, the, I don't know, the safe place I could just hang out at. And yeah, so, so it was okay. I, I definitely wasn't close to her husband. Then they later got divorced and it was some drama as well, but He's an Israeli guy and she lived in Israel for a while and so on. Um, so let's talk about your dad. So do you guys really argue a lot? Um, how was, was he a lot more strict on you from like the perception that I'm getting? Yeah, I guess so, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, he would be, he would try to be strict, I guess, but maybe not be good at it because it didn't always work. But there would just be a lot of tension. Um, maybe it's a little bit of a normal thing for for teenage boys or something to just want to do what they want. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I remember, I think I was in the wrong most of the time. When I think back on it, just like being a slob and having a really dirty room or something, I kind of try to be really clean these days. and always do the dishes, living in my house with my girlfriend now. I'm like, I, I'm the one who always does the vacuuming or, or whatever. But when I was a kid, I was such a slob. And I think I was definitely in the wrong about that. And I should have cleaned up. I mean, that's a common thing to argue about, right? There was the school, like I was saying. Uh, but yeah, I should have been a little bit more self-driven, but Maybe it just takes people as long as it takes them to, to learn. I think I was a late bloomer in a lot of ways. So. <laughs> um, so what do you guys argue about today? Do you still argue all the time because he lives in a different place than you? If we argue about anything today, it's about politics, which is probably not a good idea to even bring up. <laughs> Yeah, that I mean, we got a very diverse family of politic politicians or political views. Yeah. So, yeah. I think I will say I think it's good to live in the Midwest. Like when I moved to California, for example, I think that people just weren't like as good at debating and arguing and stuff because maybe most people it's like a blue state. Most people agree. Like Ohio is a is a swing state. All right, so you'll get a lot of different point of views and people will, will go back and forth. So, yeah, um, that's definitely I kind true. Of, I, I do like debating about politics, to be honest. It's definitely a tumultuous time in America now. Maybe tensions are too high, and unless something is really important, maybe don't bring it up at Thanksgiving <laughs> unless it's a really important issue. But yeah, um, I still. I'm still opinionated. I don't know. I think I think me and my dad are both stubborn, so it can clash. <laughs> um, so you talk about um, you basically not being Jewish anymore. Was that a point of tension between you and your dad as well? 
Not so much, actually. Um, I mean, I think the word Jewish, it's, it's complicated, and, but I think it's, it's, a, it's like a Venn diagram overlap of ethnicity and religion. You know what I mean? And if I'm, if I'm Ashkenazim, Jewish is my ethnic group, then that's my ethnic group. That I'm, that's fine with me. I'm not going to like pretend I'm not. Um, but with my personal spiritual beliefs, I think they're closer to atheism, like the, for who I am right now, it's not really my religion. Uh, I hope I'm not offending you or anything. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> Don't, yeah. People offend each other yeah, in the family. <laughs> Yeah, but I had not a bar mitzvah when I was a kid, and I think it was a good thing to do. I think anything where you force kids to study is good. You know, if, if I went to Hebrew school and I learned, like, a little bit of basic Hebrew, you know, a foreign language, that's good. And so you make me memorize a bunch of prayers and give speech, and it's a, it's a tradition that, that some people like. I, that's a positive experience. Um, I think that... For me, I don't have the gene where I'm like, I enjoy doing traditions because there's a lot of people who aren't religious, but they, you know, they celebrate the holidays because it's just, it's, it's part of community and things like that, right? And I don't really care that much, to be honest. Like, I've lived abroad outside of America for a while, and I haven't really celebrated any Jewish holidays in a few years, unless maybe a relative visits and they want to find the local synagogue or something um but uh, to be honest my dad would, wouldn't really push me that hard um the one thing we argued about i'll tell you is that um i'm a pescatarian i don't eat meat but i eat seafood and i used to always eat shrimp flavored ramen because it's just that. like oh yeah see there you go you know what i mean and it's like there's not that many vegetarian flavors, but I'll eat shrimp, I'll eat seafood. So I would always eat that. And he got mad at me. Like this is like when I'm in my twenties and just hanging around on the weekend too much or something at his house. Cause most of the food there is free, but I bring, I cook my own shrimp ramen and he'd get mad at me because it's not kosher and he eats kosher style. <laughs> but fair enough. It's his house. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, so let's talk about, a little bit more lighter subject. So you have a bunch of tattoos. What's your favorite tattoo you have? Oh, I mean, I have a few. I don't know. I, I really like the Chinese I Ching that I got on my, on my like bicep. I think that it was a really good idea. <laughs> and I don't know. I guess I think it looks cool. I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, if, I, it's, if I can describe it like in an audio medium, uh, it's it's kind of like Chinese fortune telling, bagua it's called. And do you know the Korean flag? If anybody can imagine the Korean flag, it has those those symbols on the four corners. Yeah. And there's actually eight of them. And it's I like read an article years ago that I thought was interesting about how it's ancient binary code. It was like different sets of of solid lines and broken lines, and it's like binary codes. So I thought that was cool. And, and if you have eight of them and you can put around a circle. So I, I like to think my tattoos have a little bit of deeper meaning to them. So. Oh, do you have any that you regret tattoo wise? No, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> I guess, you know, I work with kids now and sometimes like they see it on my arm and they're like, ah, oh, teacher's a bad guy. <laughs> and I guess I could have like hit it better by just putting it up on my arm but i don't think i'm a guy who has like sleeve tattoos and you have to wear long sleeves if you're really in a strict office and, you know tattoos that go up your neck or something that everybody can see i think i'm still can pull off being professional off most of the time but sometimes they creep so that'd be the only negative thing um i think i thought about them i like drawing i like aesthetics so even the me of like 15 years ago probably had somewhat good taste and wouldn't get a completely dumb one that I regret now. <laughs> um, so you talked about kind of floating between jobs um, and that you were a TV audience member. So what was like the best TV show that you were an audience member on? Oh, that's such a funny question. <laughs> yeah, so when I first moved to California, 
at first I lived in the city of Long Beach. Can I tell the, the backstory a bit? Yeah, go right ahead. Um, yes, yeah, so I first lived in Long Beach because my sister was going to get college in Cal State Long Beach. And I, but I really wanted to just see what it'd be like to live in LA. And I started taking uh, screenwriting classes at uh, LA City College. And I moved to Silver Lake, which is kind of the hipster neighborhood of, of LA. But it was really hard for me to get a job. And I wasn't the best waiter. Like I had a little experience doing that, but it was a lot of competition. And there's this stereotype of all the actors who want to be waiters, right? And that in the, in the West Coast. And I did find out that you can get jobs really easily being an extra. And you just kind of show up and there's so many jobs and they pay you a hundred dollars a day, which is just minimum wage, but it'd be 12 hour days. And every once in a while you get to see a movie star and there's lots of free food and it wasn't bad. It was very boring though. I don't like that. I don't think I could do it now, but it's always fascinating to see a real movie set. And yeah, and one of the most common jobs actually is being an audience member on new game shows or new talk shows. There was one, I think it didn't take off with Jimmy Kimmel, where you, I don't know, pick up a, a light switch to win. Um, yeah, but I, I didn't like any of those audience jobs. Those were dumb. What about movies? Uh, yeah, the, the best movie I was in, I'm trying to remember, I was in an episode of 24. Um, I was in some movie where they blew up a bus. But I think the best experience I had, there was this movie called, and by the way, a lot of these movies are not even that big because the really good movies don't even shoot in Los Angeles. They shoot in Canada or some other place in the world on location. But there's still a lot of movie sets there. Uh, the movie was called, the oh, what was it called? It had Tom Hanks' son in it. And uh, John Malkovich was in it. And it was about, he was a mentalist. And there was some scene where he was hypnotizing a hundred people. Oh, it was called The Great Buck Howard. But it, was, it wasn't really that big a movie. Anyways, he, he, he was hypnotizing a hundred people. And I was one of the hundred people being hypnotized. And then, um, and then in one of the breaks, I just saw John Malkovich reading. And you're not supposed to talk to the talent if you're an extra. But I just approached him and talked to him for a few minutes about the book he was reading, and that was kind of cool. <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds actually kind of fun. Um, so in California, or I don't even know where this is. So you talked about how Burning Man, that experience changed your life and how you've been a few times. Can you tell me about your experience with that and what it did for you? Yeah, well, the most direct way to change my life is that I just met someone who helped me get a job in China when I was there. But I went in 2007, 2008, and it's really a surreal experience. I've been to a lot of different countries, and that's probably the most alien place I've been. And if you know about it, it's, it's the third biggest city in Nevada for just one week. And it's very hardcore counterculture. I'm not really a raver in general. I prefer like rock music and live bands or, and stuff like that. But even, even by 2007, I think electronic music was, was the big thing. Everybody wants to be a DJ more than they want to be a rock star, you know? And uh, yeah, so, but, but it was, it was really interesting as a, as, as a weird rave in the, in the daytime, it's kind of like a yoga hippie art festival where you look at sculptures and then at nighttime, it's like a rave and everything is made out of glow sticks. And it just, I don't know, it just pushed my, my comprehension of experiences, you know, it just pushed me to another limit of how weird the world can be. And I think it just opened me up creatively in that way. And yeah, in 2008, when I went, I was kind of between things in life anyways. And I just met this guy and he was drunk and wandering around the middle of the desert. And he was like, I can help you find a job in China, man. And I was like, really? I want to do that. <laughs> and then I exchanged email addresses and took him up on the offer and it actually worked out. Wow, that way I would, I don't know if I would have trust that. <laughs> 
Yeah, maybe I wouldn't have either, but I was already doing crazy stuff like Burning Man, so that's true. <laughs> that's you know gave me more of the incentive, I guess. <laughs> Um, so you talked about favorite rock musicians, then we'll continue back to the story. What are your favorite rock musicians? Because I'm just very interested in that. Oh, sure. When I was a kid, I really liked Green Day. That was probably my favorite band when I was, when I was young. I liked that kind of punk music. I had a lot of friends who were really much better music aficionados than me and who knew a lot more about underground punk music than I did and indie rock. Um... I think the 90s, all the alternative kids liked Smashing Pumpkins and Nine Inch Nails. I mean, do your kids still like that? <laughs> I mean, I'm a very different kid when because everyone just likes the weird pop and rap music. I'm like much more, I like the Seattle sound, like Nirvana. That's probably my favorite band. I like yeah. the grunge rock. That's my favorite. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, what are some of my, my favorites? I think in my 20s, I like Bright Eyes, which... Maybe it's a guilty pleasure now. It's 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 kind of emo. It's kind of lame, but I liked it at the time. Um, nowadays, I like to listen to a lot of indie tronica kind of music, which I think combines kind of the rock music aesthetic of like you know, there's lyrics you can sing along to, you know, and it's not just like empty pop music either. It's like supposed to be kind of poetic, right? But they are, but there are drum machines and electronic aspects. So there's some bands I really like, um, the Naked and the Famous and the Limousines. I think they do that kind of indie tronica style very well. Um, yeah, does does that cover a good amount? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, you don't have to. Don't feel like you just need to keep talking because you just need to fill time. You're fine. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about. We'll get to some stories in a minute, but let's talk about your writing and stuff because that's really what you're passionate about right you're writing in your novels yeah that's what i that's what i want to be doing yeah that's supposed to be my thing <laughs> so what was the first book you ever wrote i wrote a book after i moved to california a novel i wrote a science fiction novel that was really short that probably wasn't very good but i just kind of tried to mail out you know, uh, these uh, the forms that the articles say you're supposed to do to get a literary agent. Uh, I don't know if that was very good. I'm going to say the first real novel I wrote was called Loser Parade. And I was really kind of proud of it. It probably hasn't aged well. And I was 25, maybe. And it was semi-autobiographical about um, a guy who failed as an actor and he had to move back to his hometown and i didn't actually end up ever moving back to my hometown but i imagined that i would one day and but i never got it published and it kind of broke my heart and i don't know i think that when i first became a quote-unquote real writer was later when i started doing journalism in china and there are a few English language publications that needed stuff like restaurant reviews. And even though where I lived, Shenzhen was a very big city, it was, the, the English speaking community was relatively a small town. So it would be easy kind of to make contacts and, and find opportunities. So I started doing, you know, this, this kind of journalism here and there, uh, book reviews, like it's kind of travel writing as well, you know, finding, a unique spot and that's that would probably be the most appropriate uh journalism when you're living abroad anyway it's mostly travel writing so i think that counted <laughs> um so you lived in hong kong right is that tr correct well i technically lived in shenzhen which is right next to hong kong but i worked in hong kong and Shenzhen is on the mainland China side. Yeah. And so there were, you know, Facebook is banned and it's like really, really mainland China and communism kind of a dictatorship. But Hong Kong is a very different government and it's really difficult to explain. But like when you yeah. go to Hong Kong, you're crossing an international border. Your passport counts it as a different country. But technically Hong Kong is, is, is part of China, but they have their own laws and sovereignty, pseudo sovereignty or something. Yeah. Uh, people who follow Asian politics understand, but 
it's it's hard to explain sometimes from for yeah, i understand some of it because i went to hong kong with my school so i took a class my oh yeah, year I think high I school. About that. Um, yeah yeah and i just like found the relationship between like china and hong kong so interesting um and so like yeah, have you ever like experienced because you were like there firsthand so what was the yeah, experience how did you like of the really i absolutely really loved it it's literally my like my favorite city it's incredible it's, it's just a really special place it's such a mix of different cultures yeah it's just like it was completely different than what i thought it was going to be because then again it's not necessarily exactly like china because it's just, even though it technically is china like it's so different of a culture yeah so what and you is and it Hong like Kong, they hate mainly in china <laughs> they can say it all they want so true <laughs> Um, so what was your experience like experiencing firsthand like the differentiation if that's the right word from like living in Shenzhen but like being in Hong Kong? Yeah, I think it, it fascinated me. I thought about the differences about them all the time and, and I tried to write about that. But I did like China a lot too. Um, I think China's gotten kind of worse. I think when I moved to China, people were predicting that if the economy is good, they're going to become democratic and that sort of thing. And it didn't work out that way, actually. Um, and so it kind of progressively got more, I don't know, closed off in time. But there are a lot of interesting things about, about China uh, that I enjoyed. But when you go to Hong Kong, you cross the border, you suddenly feel like you're in the real world. Because, <laughs> I mean, technically it's a first world country, Hong Kong, and, and China's a developing country anyway. And it just feels more sophisticated and, and everybody in Hong Kong has traveled abroad and, and stuff like that. In China, there's, um, there's a big gap between rich people and poor people, and poor people really won't get the opportunity to, to leave China and see what it's like in other parts of the world. And there's also a big gap between the old generation and young generation. And the old generation, for lack of a better word, are kind of brainwashed and they really believe everything the government tells them. And they're really conservative. But the young generation isn't necessarily like that. They're, they're kind of, they're, they're pretty cosmopolitan and, and stuff if you're in a big city. And even in Shenzhen though, I think more than other Chinese cities, because it's next to Hong Kong, people are pretty open-minded and, and, and all that and educated because they can go to Hong Kong if they want. And it's probably the richest Chinese city. They're in Shanghai. Uh, but the contrast between mainland China and, and, and other parts of the China world, like Taiwan too, where I am now, has, has always interested me because it's, it's the same history, but it's such a different like take, different path that that country could have went on yeah it'd be like i don't know if you just if you had like an alternate reality where where america lost the revolutionary war or lost the civil war and there was like one city that had this different government or one state that had like a different government because the history turned out differently you go there and compare what it's like to the rest of america and be like that Wow, yeah, I mean, it's really cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about stories. Um, so can you tell me what happened? Because these stories I've learned from your book and I'm kind of just interested to learn more. Um, so what happened when you, cra like with the car crash um, in 2010 um, on your trip across America? How oh. There? <laughs> oh, that trip? Well, I don't think I'm that good of a driver. I never really liked having a car and having to pay insurance and stuff like that. I didn't even learn to drive till I was 18, while most of my friends learned when they were 16. And then when I moved to California, I didn't have a car and use public transportation, which is kind of a tricky thing in California, but you can, you can do it. But I prefer to live in big cities where everybody, where there's a subway system. But anyway, so um, I already lived in Shenzhen for two years, and then I just borrowed my mom's car, and then I got in a small fender bender with her car, and there was all this insurance stuff to work out. Are you sure it was 2010? Because there's another car I had when I was younger. I'll tell you both stories. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so I didn't even like drive a car for two years. But then my mom let me borrow her car while I was visiting for, for the summer, which maybe wasn't a good idea for her. 
And yeah, I just, I, I was trying to parallel park. Um, and I told this other car to go around me, but then the other car scratched me because I kind of forgot that when you parallel park, you become more in the other direction, uh, if that makes sense, if you can imagine it. And what happened was the insurance company called me and they just said it was a draw and nobody was at fault. And so the other car, I think they shouldn't have went because I was waving them off anyway. Uh, but that, I don't know, that wasn't that bad. It's the kind of thing like, where if you have a, if you don't care if your car, if you have a used car, you don't really care if it has a few more scratches. But if you have a new car, you you you're you're mad and you want the other person to pay for your to fix the scratches, the small dents. Yeah, but it was pretty minor. Um, but when when I was younger, I worked one of my odd jobs as a pizza delivery car driver. And I got in a bad wreck and I was using like their car. It wasn't even my car. Sometimes I used my car and sometimes I was allowed to use this company car. And I was so lucky because I got no consequences for it. I wrecked the car. I did an illegal U-turn and somebody slammed the side of me. And there was no consequences. I think the guy who hit me uh, didn't have a license because he didn't oh want to God. deal with it. So he was just like, yeah, I don't care, bye. <laughs> and yeah, and, and what happened was, even at that job, I wasn't even technically fired, but they said, I'm not allowed to drive the company car anymore. You have to drive your own car from now on. And that, was, that was it. That was all they said. They didn't, like, make you pay for anything. <laughs> they didn't, and they probably could have. Maybe the, the Domino's Corporation just its not a big deal to them. <laughs> it was kind of a bad accident, though. No one was hurt, but the car was pretty messed up after that. Then, then they still had to deliver the pizza that was late, and somebody else delivered it. <laughs> oh my god! Um, yeah. So you just one Go more ahead. thing. Uh, last year, I visited America, and I rented a car, and I was really worried that I'd be a bad driver, and and I was fine. So I'm not. All, I think I grew out of being a bad driver, even though I didn't practice. I just got older and wiser. And that's the moral of the story. Um, so you, why did you not want to get your license until you were 18? Um, one of my friends was kind of the driver of the group. I think I was a little lazy too. Uh, so, but it wasn't a problem getting around because I'd always hang out with this specific group of friends and they would drive us. And uh, the, the one friend would always be, be the designated driver. Um, I don't know. It costs a lot of money to get a car, and I didn't want to spend all my part-time job money on on that. Uh, I don't know. I was just being a late bloomer, I guess. Did, did you do you drive? Um, yeah, I drive. I don't like it. I really just don't like it. I mean, I'm. It's just so boring because everywhere I live is like half an hour away from me like sitting in the car and I actually have to pay attention when I do it and I just like don't have that attention span <laughs> yeah I think I'm kind of scatterbrained too I'm always I'm kind of a nervous driver I'm always expecting to forget what I'm doing and then just all of a sudden <laughs> crash and kill everyone <laughs> I um, once like recently I just ran through like a red light like without even thinking about it It wasn't like there weren't a lot of people around thank god but like I just like sp like spaced it kind of happens, but you have to also make sure it doesn't happen. It also just takes years of experience and it becomes more second nature. True. At least you're self-aware. That's good. You're not, like, incompetent but confident at the same time because that's a bad combination. Definitely So just true. be cautious. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I just put it off, and then when I was 18, I was like, okay, fine. I do have to get a license eventually, and then I did. Now I drive a motorbike, though which everyone does in Taiwan, and like a scooter, Vespa kind of vehicle. And I'm pretty used to that now. At first, I was really nervous doing that, but I, bi I bicycle a lot too, so it's kind of similar, just faster. Um, so let's talk about one more story. So you mentioned when you were on your way to Alana's wedding that you had an embarrassing moment in an airport. Can you tell everyone about that moment? Sure, sure. Um, so my sister Lana had a wedding in Israel and she moved to Israel after college and, and uh, I came to visit her 
for the wedding and I flew from the Hong Kong airport and it was El Al, which is the really hardcore security airline, you know, and they were kind of, um, they did the interview thing. If you've ever flown El Al, they're like, where are you going? Did anybody else pack your bag? Where are you going? Did anybody else pack your bag? You know, keep, keep repeating it to see if they can catch you in a lie, right? And it was kind of weird because I was telling them that my sister's getting married, but I couldn't remember the name of her fiance. So that was kind of suspicious. <laughs> Who is she marrying? What's his name? And I was like, uh, I forgot. <laughs> so they took me to the bottom, like this basement of the Hong Kong airport and did a strip search of me. <laughs> it was really demeaning. Um, I guess they have to do what they have to do, but... I didn't like That's, it. Did they do and it to every single person that went through like security? They like uh, there were, interviewed there were two them? Other people. There were two other people down there. There was like a Hong Kong woman and like a Russian woman. And I don't know if they thought they were up to no good or what it was. But it wasn't everyone. And there's other times I've flown to Israel and haven't hadn't had an experience that bad. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, we have a few more questions here. Um, so can you tell me about your stalker girlfriend and what happened there? Oh, geez, that's a traumatic memory for me. I don't know, there was this time in my life where I just really wanted to internet date. And, and I, I don't know if I was lowering my standards or something, but I was just trying out and, and, and dating a few different girls. And yeah, there was this one girl who I met and we went on a few dates and I was kind of being the shallow guy saying, I don't want to have a girlfriend right now, so don't take this too seriously. And she just really wanted to take it seriously. And she kept coming over and she kept, I don't know, I was kind of scared of the situation. I never had a situation like that before. And she came to my job and I, I don't know, I felt kind of sorry for her and stuff. I just I just decided in the end, like, I don't think we'll be a good match. Um, you know, she, she was Chinese, mainland Chinese, and maybe she was kind of conservative and wanted to get married and stuff like that. And maybe I'm the privileged Westerner and I should have been more cautious and not messing with someone's feelings or something. I feel guilty about some of it. But I also think she really shouldn't come to my job and bother me. I think that's crossing a boundary that people aren't supposed to do. And I don't know, after a while it faded away. Um, but I was worried because she would, she, had, she, she disappeared and went traveling or something like that. And her cousins were emailing me saying, we're worried about her, where is she? And I was like, I don't know. I'm so sorry, but also it's not my fault. And yeah, jeez. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think that I will say this: that culturally, people should be a little bit cautious. And I don't think I should like take advantage. I don't think Westerners who move to to less developed countries should take advantage by having a a girlfriend in that country unless they're really serious and. I think I grew out of that and my current girlfriend Bronwyn is from South Africa and she's like from an English speaking country and we have similar tastes in movies and, and a background and, and music and stuff like that. She's the same age as me and we have like a cultural connection and I mean, I mean pop culture but it's still something, it's still culture and I just think that's a better system for relationships and meeting people. Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about how did you meet your current me. girlfriend? How did you meet her? I met her at a screening of the Captain America Winter Soldier movie. <laughs> and I was organizing a group of friends to watch it. And I knew her friend from a writer's group in Shenzhen. And her friend brought Bronwyn over to to be part of the group. And I just kind of got to know her and texted her and I thought she was cool. and. We texted here and there, and uh, our first date was at a comedy club, and eventually I had the courage to ask her out properly, <laughs> and yeah, we were basically just from the same scene in, in Shenzhen of, of expats and teachers and stuff. 
So how long have you guys been together? Now we've been together at least five years. Yeah, my, my record. I'm kind of common law married, to be honest. Oh, if I was more traditional, we'd do the whole wedding ceremony, but I I'm don't think you? I'm in it for the long haul. <laughs> you should, because then you could throw a big party and have that as the excuse. Boom, there you go. <laughs> okay, take into consideration. One day, probably. Um, I gotta save up. <laughs> true. Those are expensive parties. Um, so let's talk about what do you think is the worst thing that you've ever done in your life? <laughs> the worst thing I've ever done in my life? I probably won't tell you. If okay. I, really, I don't know. Um, maybe it was that stalker situation. I don't know. The worst thing I ever did. I, there was a small period of time I shoplifted when I was a teenager. That was kind of bad. Jeez. I shouldn't do that. I mean, I don't think I ever did anything that is going to give me the worst karma. Um, you I don't know. Uh, so me and my friend, we would shoplift. I remember shoplifting cigarettes and I didn't even smoke. I just like thought it was funny. And I was probably 14, maybe like a freshman in high school. And, and we just went to Walmart and shoplifted, uh, candy bars, really petty stuff just cause it was supposed to be funny. And then when we were caught and they, they threatened to call the police and called our parents to pick us up. Then I didn't do it anymore after that. Yeah, good idea. Don't do Don't steal. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll tell you this. Um, I broke many copyright laws in China because everyone does, because there are no copyright laws in China. But I don't feel super guilty about that. <laughs> That's just... <laughs> I know your dad's a, a, a judge, though, so maybe I should be careful what I say. <laughs> True. A lot of our family are lawyers, so <laughs> you could have good representation, though, in court. So there you go. Um, so are you ready for the lightning round? Uh-oh. I'll try to uh, think fast. Just, nobody really, like, I feel like people don't actually take it like a lightning round. Only a few people have I ever interviewed do it as a lightning round. Other people go into, like, tangents. I'm not very good at uh, improv and, and stuff, but let's see. Let's go, go for it. Okay, talking or texting? Oh, texting. <laughs> uh, favorite day of the week? Uh, Saturday. Uh, favorite U.S. city? I'm going to say New York City. Cliché for, cliche for a reason. Um, nickname your parents used to call you? Oh, my mom used to call me Raychik. It's some kind of cutesy Russian language thing. Raychik. Um, favorite holiday? Uh, you know, I like New Year's Day a lot. It's optimistic. New Year's Eve, the night before when you have the part and everything, you feel optimistic for the next year. Um, like how long does it take you to get ready in the morning? Oh, I work evenings for the most part. So I, it literally takes me four hours. I just like a very slow burn of, of getting up and drinking coffee and watching TV and reading. And, and I don't even feel fully awake till the afternoon. Um, so what <laughs> age do you want to... but only a little bit. Um, what age do you want to retire at? Uh, in one way, I don't ever want to retire because I would really like to just be a professional novelist and just write forever and you can make your own hours but also I want to not have a real job like a physical office job kind of place 50 as young as possible I don't want to go to a place for work um do you snore at night I don't think so nobody told me I did uh favorite junk food um Chocolate candy bars, I eat too much. Chocolate uh, Reese's or something, stuff like that. Um, favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, a chocolate. Cookies and cream, maybe. I don't like the fruit ones as much. Yeah, I agree. I don't like... Yeah. <laughs> um, 
okay, do you want to live forever or would you? Yeah, why not? Uh, but you should also be at peace with mortality. But also, if you could be a, a robot for a thousand years, I would be so curious to see what the world's going to be like in the future. Maybe not literally forever, but functionally way more than humans can now. I would I'm be very curious to see what the world would be like in the future. It's a sci-fi fan in me. They say that the first person to live to be 150 is already alive today. Isn't that weird? And you hope that's you. You hope that's you. It's probably someone younger than me. It's probably a baby or something. No, but still. <laughs> uh, would you like to get a pet, or do you have a pet? Um, I'm so anxious about getting a dog. My girlfriend really wants a dog, but I'm so so nervous about all the work it will be and then it's and then you can't move to another country if you have a, a dog i'm a dog person though i really do love dogs that's what i would get and i don't think i want anything else because you won't really be that close to it. it'll it be easy to take care of a hamster or something but it's just not as fun <laughs> what would you name your dog uh now we're thinking of naming a dog stanley why stanley i don't know she had a dream or something with a dog named Stanley. It sounds cute to me. It's an honor of the... Stan Lee. That's actually super funny. I learned the other day or whatever, like, we were looking through photos, and there's people that name their dogs, like, there's Terry the Terrier, like, it's Terrier. And then my great-grandma <laughs> on my mom's side named her dog Puppy. I don't, don't <laughs> just don't name your dogs weird names like that. That's so you'll corny. Be fine. There used to be people like in the 50s named Buddy and Guy. You know, I don't. I know an Israeli words. kid named Guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that came up, but yeah. Um, how many cups of coffee do you drink per day? I used to drink two or three. I drink instant coffee packets, but I used to drink too much and I think it made my sleep worse. I think I'm sensitive to caffeine. So I try to have one less. So I try to have one to two a day. Yeah. I've only gotten, the AM hours. If it's PM I can't. Yeah, I've gotten in a kick of like three or four cups a day and my mom's needing to limit me because it's so bad. <laughs> it is true that if you if you have insomnia, even having coffee twelve hours earlier can make a difference. Oh, I don't have insomnia, so we're okay there. But we might, I might soon. <laughs> but the, but it does have an effect many more hours later than people think it does. Studies show or something. Um. So have you ever slapped someone in the face? Jeez, no, I'm nonviolent. I think I got in a few fights when I was in junior high because that's the the time boys just really want to fight for some reason, <laughs> and I think there was a few times bullies or push me around or something and I would get in shove fights and I don't think since then um have you ever climbed a mountain um not really I like to like going hiking in a, in a hill kind of but would it, but climbing a mountain like with your hands I've never done do you want to nah I don't know if that's me um what type of uh cereal Not do you that like old, i like sometimes i like granola cereal sometimes i really like chocolatey something like chocolate rice krispies super sugary cereal i have a sweet tooth yeah i super sugary cereal sometimes is too much i think but it's okay uh what's your go-to movie um my go-to movie, like a movie I'll watch more than once? Yeah. I like so many different kinds of movies. Uh, but I think the 1986 Transformers movie is the, it's the nerdiest possible answer. But I've watched that movie so many times, and I recently re-watched it just because, I don't know, just because every few years I need to re-watch the ridiculous 1986 Transformers animated movie. I don't know if that's like my number one hobby that reflects on me well, but I also like artsy movies sometimes. But <laughs> um, who is your favorite um, author? 
Uh, I, that's a good question. I had several. I really like Neil Stevenson, the science fiction author who writes these big thousand page books about like cyberpunk technology predicting what the near future is going to be like in all these weird, bizarre ways. I'm a big fan of his. I really like the author Robert Anton Wilson, who wrote the, the Illuminatus trilogy, these kind of satirical conspiracy theory weird psychedelic books. I get a lot out of reading him. Uh, those two authors might be my two favorites. Um, so we're done with the lightning round. So I do have a question for you. So you're living in Taiwan and it's in the middle of a pandemic. How are you dealing with it? What's kind of the reality of living in Taiwan? Right I think now? I have it better than you guys right now. Uh, Taiwan, oddly enough, it's right next to China. It's, uh, it's one of four countries in the world, I think, where schools are still open. And they have this a really good healthcare system that can keep track of every single person that has it. And so it's fine. The only thing that's really annoying is that you have to wear masks everywhere and you have to wait in line to buy masks. And you can only buy a certain amount per week. Uh, but I'm, you know, they, they give you a, health, a government health insurance card that, that keeps track of how many masks you can buy. And, uh, but it's, it's eerily normal, and I'm watching on TV about how the rest of the world has gone, is, is in this really terrible place, and it's weird. That's the most surreal thing for me. Uh, but, I, I mean, I hope you guys are okay, and, and it's not driving you too crazy to be stuck inside all the time, and, you know, you feel positive about staying healthy, True. not scared or anything. But Taiwan is really one of the only countries that, is, that has it under control. Do you know any people that are being affected by it in mainland China? In mainland China, yeah. When, when back in January, when it first started there, it was kind of the same thing as what's happening in America now, where I'd be like calling people, like, "Are you okay? What's happening?" And yeah, but I know I know a lot of people in mainland China who are just who are shut down in their apartment for the whole month, January and February, and all the cities are deserted and everything like that. Uh, yeah, and I think it's hard. Uh, I've heard about people who have work visas that ended and they needed to leave, but they can't leave because you're not allowed to fly. And the, the people's lives have really been upended in so many ways. I know this couple in Taiwan who, the, who, who got married and the, the wife is pregnant and she was going to go fly to her own country to have the baby, but now she can't. And she has to plan to have the baby in Taiwan because of this. It's really affected people's lives in so many ways. Um, so we're about to end. Do you have anything else you want to say to anybody listening, our family that's listening? Um, I don't know. I, 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 sorry, I haven't kept in touch better. You know, I think I've had a a weird life and I drift, but I'm I'm pretty easy to keep in touch with on social media. So that's my that's my efficient way to. To, to keep in touch so feel free to look me up and, and add me and and I'm sorry if it took this hard time to get together again but I would like to keep in touch and I wish everybody the best and just stay healthy and it's been really nice to listen to your podcast and, and hear what people have been doing yeah so well thank you so very much for joining me today thank you so much for having me